Hi, I'm Melissa Sturcha. I'm the author of the Blood and Darkness series, the Beautiful Dark Beast series, and the Immortal Billionaires series. You can find me at melissasturcha.com, and you are watching me on Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by not only a podcast host from Spoiler Country, but also for an, a published author, as well as a very talented individual in her own way. Uh, of course, we are going to talk about herself as an author and touch upon the podcasting side of things as well. We're joined today by Melissa Searcher. How are you doing today, Melissa? I'm, I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. As an author, it's, it's a, an interesting process because your brain is your your vault of knowledge and your storytelling and everything along that line but for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're all about well i am an author as you mentioned <laughs> i write urban fantasy and paranormal romance and i have been published since 2018. i started writing when i was very young didn't really take it seriously as a profession until I was about 35 and was working a corporate job that I couldn't stand and realized that I needed to finally pursue my creative endeavors. I started blotting that novel. And that's what I do now. And I'm, I do it mostly full-time. Um, I'm hoping to, to become a completely a full-time author. Aside from that, I do co-host a podcast, Spoiler Country. That is me kind of in a nutshell right now. What is the most misunderstood aspect about urban <clears throat> fantasy as an author? Wow. Misunderstood. Well, I think just the term alone, I think there's so many different subgenres in books that people get confused. Readers mainly, you know, as an author, we tend to study those and learn them. I think that, you know, we think of fantasy and there's so many different things. You, know, you think of Game of Thrones and Shadow and Bone, Lord of the Rings, things like that. But urban fantasy is more specifically geared into real life in modern times. So it's essentially like a real world setting, like a city, New Orleans, New York. There's magical elements that are brought into the story that are surrounding normal type of living. Like I think Twilight, for example, you know, Twilight is the story about a girl, you know, a human girl in high school, and then there's vampires living, you know, <laughs> in the woods. So essentially that's a typical urban fantasy plot um, where you're sort of living normal life and then all this, this supernatural element is brought in. So I think that's the, the biggest like misunderstood thing is just what it is exactly. It also doesn't always have to be a romance. Um, urban fantasy is so different than let's say paranormal romance. You can have a, a subplot of two characters, um, you know, getting together, but urban fantasy tends to be more about the quest, the journey, you know, the battle between good and evil, things like that. So then why do you like writing about the battle between good and evil in both paranormal and supernatural? Oh, well, I think there is a battle within yourself as well as an external battle. And I think with urban fantasy, you get to explore those like bigger themes that we all ponder as far as like life and death and immortality. And then with paranormal romance, that battle between good and evil has a lot to do with your relationships to people and your emotions. And I don't think anyone is all good or all bad. And there's like a healthy balance, hopefully. <laughs> I have villains that don't have a healthy balance. <laughs> I think that's what draws me to those themes because even though I'm writing about magical creatures that technically don't exist, I'm still dealing with themes that we all tackle in our daily lives. So what themes in your own life do you struggle with? Oh my gosh, probably like balance, you know, really that's a big one for me. Uh, making sure that I'm getting enough sleep and eating right and having enough time to write, but still having enough time to spend with my family and friends and not neglecting any of those parts. That's a big deal. I'm extremely ambitious and, you know, I'm 42, almost 43, and I still haven't achieved the level of su success that I want. I've done a lot, don't get me wrong. And I'm very, very proud of what I've accomplished. But I think that sort of theme of like ambition and being independent and going after what you want. It's, it's a quest in itself. You know, I'm on a, and I get off on these little side quests sometimes, but the main quest is to, you know, keep writing and reaching those readers and touching people's lives and 
hopefully becoming someone's favorite author. Then looking at your career so far, even though you, you may have started later than you may have wanted to in your lifetime, what was the first thing you wrote that you thought, yes, I could do this as a career? You know, I, I wrote poetry for a really, really long time since I was like nine years old. I wrote my first poem. And I got really good at that. And I was really proud as I got into my 20s and I would just, it would take me two seconds to write something to articulate my thoughts and put it on paper and have it sound pretty and, you know, poetic. And I was really proud of that. But to be honest, I mean, I think it was when I sat down and wrote Blood and Magic, which is my debut novel, I really surprised myself because writing a novel when you when you've never done it is so daunting and intimidating and where do you even begin you know i did take classes and things like that but when i finally wrote that final draft and i probably wrote a million drafts of it before i actually submitted it to anyone <laughs> but when i wrote that final draft i was just so proud of myself and i'm like okay well let's see where this ends up hopefully somebody will buy it but even if they don't i'm like i wrote one and basically i sent it out to a bunch of people and then i said i'm going to just start working on the next thing and just not you know get kind of caught up in where it's going to end up blood and magic i really like looked back and then when i when of course when it was published and like this publishing company like wanted to put their name behind it and everything that was a huge accomplishment and holding that book in my hands i was like oh my god i can't believe i've done it <laughs> There's a huge difference between the visual medium of TV and film versus the novel. Obviously, in a novel, you're able to express yourself and your world a, a whole lot better than what you can in a two-hour block for a film. <laughs> what did you draw from to create the world of your entire series? Because you don't have just Blood and Darkness and Blood and Magic. You have Immortal and It's a bunch of others. Yeah. Are, are these all <clears throat> interconnected worlds? Well, two of the series are interconnected. So the Blood and Darkness trilogy and Beautiful Dark Beasts, those are connected. Immortal Billionaires is completely new and different. Uh, I mean, it's still supernatural and paranormal, but yeah, a different series. So when I was plotting uh, Blood and Magic, you know, my first book, my first series, I was really inspired by Greek mythology because I'm fascinated by mythology and also history. The way that I constructed it is basically this character came to mind, Gray, who's this 400-year-old Dampier, which is my version of a vampire. And I knew that I wanted her to be 400 years old so that she had all of this history and background um, that I could pull from whenever I wanted. I also wanted to tie it into something that really actually maybe existed but like give a different explanation for it. So to clarify, I basically start researching like what happened 400 years ago in different parts of the world. It brought me to Lancashire, England, where there was the famous Pendle witch trials. There were um, a bunch of witches, I think 10 or 11 witches that were tried and convicted, but there was one that didn't get convicted. She was let go for some reason. And so I constructed this whole theory in my head for book writing purposes that she was let go because the, the people holding the witch trial were actually this organization that were supernatural themselves. And she was actually not a witch, but a vampire. And they didn't want to like basically have her wrath upon them. So that's why she was let go. And, and that's how the backstory for Blood and Magic started. Um, and I don't want to give too much away if, if for those who haven't read it. It spins this like really tangled web of characters that are all intertwined or based on the Pendle Witches. Obviously, looking into mythology, history itself is usually created by those that have won the wars and won mm -hmm. <laughs> their version of history can always be interpreted in a, a variety of different ways. Did you look deep into the history itself in, in general and kind of pull from what inspired you or was it something along the lines of, you know, I like this version of history, but maybe it could use a bit of a spice. Up. Yeah, definitely the latter. I a fan of history, but I also am a little aware of what you were saying about it not being, it's different versions of, of the people that won, as you say, and, you know, it's just like, for example, when, when you're in school and you're in high school and you learn history, you learn all this like sort of fluffy, pretty you know, stuff about it. And then when you get into college, you actually, you know, start taking more um, specific classes like women's history. And you're like, oh, wait, <laughs> this isn't exactly how I remember it. It becomes more interesting, I think, as an adult to like go back and, and study rather than from like just your childhood memories of 
what you thought history was. And, you know, we could get all into like, you know, how the Native American history has been so skewed. So basically, I really like to just spend history on its head, like, but in a fantasy way, you know, because I'm I'm not writing nonfiction. I take the the Black Plague, for example, that happens was really, you know, in my books, it was the vampires. They were killing people and they were covering it up and putting crosses on the graves to to mark, you know, who they've basically infected. And then with the mythology too, it's so interesting because, you know, I've talked about this a lot before Christianity existed, before it was known that the Greek gods were essentially religion. They weren't mythology. Now we call them mythology. That's interesting to me. And like, why did the civilization really believe they existed? And then all of a sudden, now they don't. It's fascinating. I believe there was a saying, something along the lines of those that cannot explain what is in front of them turn to religion. Those that refute religion become scientists, something along that line. Right, exactly. Well, and that's basically what it came down to. It wasn't, it wasn't, the rain wasn't ruining your crops because the, you know, the God was upset with you is the science of, you know, weather, but still, but in a fantasy aspect, there's just so much you can do with that. Does writing energize or exhaust you? Oh gosh, both sometimes depends. I find it's therapeutic at times. So if I'm having anxiety or I'm stressed about anything can escape into my writing, then it does energize me. If I'm trying to hit a deadline and I'm, you know, sort of stressed about the writing itself, then it can be exhausting. A lot of times it's just sometimes physically exhausting only because, you know, you're staring at a screen for a long time. Your hands can start to cramp up from typing. I I write a lot. Like when I go at it, I'm three to 6,000 words type of person a day, a session. So yeah, that can be exhausting. I mean, I'm human. Unfortunately, I'm not immortal. You know, those things tend to weigh on you after a while, but from the mental aspect and emotional aspect, it's definitely energizing. I feel you know, a hundred times better when I'm like, oh, I did it. I, I did 3000 words today. I finished that chapter. I can celebrate. I can relax. Like now I don't feel guilty if I go watch television or, you know, read a book or something. I'm like, oh, I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I like being productive and I'm very hard on myself. Yeah. It can energize you and exhaust you in, in different ways. Do you think that someone could be a writer if they don't feel emotion? Mm, wow. Um, are you talking about like AI, <laughs> like, uh, robots or, or like, what do you mean by like not feel emotion? Like someone who's just kind of an apathetic person. Well, I believe that everybody has emotion. And I think even like lacking emotion is still an emotion. It's, it's just, you're putting a guard up or you're not, you're denying your emotion. I do think that anyone that wants to be a writer can write. I, I mean, there's obviously varying degrees of like, if it's going to be readable or if people are going to relate to it. I definitely think there is, you know, a book to be written for for everyone that wants to try their hand at it. I always say that there's room on my bookshelf for, for everyone. It's not an overly competitive market as far as, I mean, it is and it isn't. I think authors are really we're supportive of each other. It's a really good community. But yeah, I think that if you are someone who's not in touch with your emotions, but you want to write, um, you can write about that. You know, there's characters uh, that I write often, these sort of male alpha characters that are emotionless, at least to begin with. And then, you know, the heroine draws it out of them or the quest or whatever, the MacGuffin will bring the different emotions out of them. So I think, yeah, absolutely. You mentioned other authors that you've connected with because this the the writing community of authors is is vast and large in this wide world of of (laughs) of writers that we do have in many different countries what other authors are you friends with and how did they help you become a better writer oh my gosh yeah i have so many great like i can't even list all of them without you know, I don't want to leave anyone out, but I will say that my two closest author friends that I talk to literally on a daily basis are Nagin Poppin and Leslie Scott. Um, they're both romance authors and Nagin is with City Owl Press, my publisher. That's how we met um, through that little City Owl family. And then via her, I met Leslie Scott. She's my 
down home, Southern Alabama girl, they help so much. It's like, there's not enough words to explain. Like when you're trying to figure something out, we do plot calls, you know, where we just kind of vent at each other when we don't know what's going on with our books, we support each other, encourage, celebrate the wins and console each other when we have the losses or the frustrations. And it's just really like, unbelievable how much you need that as an author, because when you're writing, sometimes it's a, it's a solo career, essentially, when you're, when you're actually sitting down and writing and you forget, you know, there's other people out there that you can reach out to and family supports as well and friends support as well. And that's amazing. But there is a special bond between authors because we get it, you know, we literally understand what we're doing and trying to accomplish every day. And there's things you can say to other authors that you can't say to someone who, who's not in it, you know, they just won't get it. So yeah, Nagin and Leslie are, I would be lost without them. <laughs> How do you balance making demands on the reader with taking care of the reader? Mm, oh, that's a really good question. It is a fine line, really. I mean, I'm essentially asking them to take a chance and go into certain, you know, darker paths than maybe they're comfortable with. I always believe in not, not insulting the reader, right? Like you hear that a lot when you're first writing, like I'm a reader myself, like we get it. You don't have to pump a bunch of backstory and info dump You can sprinkle things in and you can bet for sure that they're going to get your foreshadowing and and the little hints that you drop. And to me, it's really rewarding when like after someone's read the whole series and then hearing their perception of certain characters or plot lines and going, ah, oh, I knew, I knew people would get it. Like, you know, I, I will say that there is one um, plot line that kind of went over some people's heads in Blood and Magic. I have a pirate ship that for me, I'm inspired by video games quite a lot. I'm a huge gamer nerd. I play a lot of Fallout and Skyrim and Outer Worlds. So I really wanted to do sort of a tribute to video games. I made my pirate ship fast traveling. And anyone that plays video games knows that you can fast travel with certain games. And it's awesome because you don't have to like trek all that way again. And so I thought, well, that'd be really cool if I had that in a fantasy novel. I tried my best to explain it, I think, in the book. But I did have a lot of people, not a lot, but a few people were like, I don't understand. How did she get to this point, to this point so quickly? And I'm like, oh, God, it just went over, you know, went over some people's heads. So that part, you know, I'm like, all right, well, you win and you lose some. And that's OK. For the most part, I trust that the readers understand what I'm trying to convey. <laughs> Could you see your series of books as maybe comic format or anything along that line? Maybe, you know, something along the lines of webtoons or tapas or anything along that line? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love comic books. I read a lot of comic books and um, I've definitely been approached by a couple of people that I know in the industry. They're like, Hey, when you're ready to write a comic book, like let us know. We'd love to work with you. So that's really exciting. It, it's just like another thing on my bucket list that I definitely want to do. I don't know if I would adapt any of my current titles to comic books. I think I would probably write something fresh from scratch, like just kind of geared for that specific medium. Some of my books, um, I don't have the rights to for one. So I, it's not really in my, you know, I'm not really allowed to like go off and <laughs> do that. And my most current series, the Immortal Billionaire series is more of a romance. And I just don't think it would suit comics. I definitely have a couple of ideas in the old arsenal <laughs> that I would like to kind of explore doing as a comic at some point for sure. Actually, the most searched genre of webtoons and tapas is romance. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. I did not know that. There, there's, it's actually 10 times more likely to find the romance genre than it is action or fantasy or anything like that. Oh, that's really interesting. I'll have to look into that more then. Realistically, romance is, is the most searched genre where you can have a million views in a, a month. Wow. That's so interesting. I would not have guessed that at all. That's cool. So that's cool. Go. All right. Well, well then research, I guess I have no so. excuse now. <laughs> What is the best book that you've read that should be made into a video game? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. The last book I've read that should be made into a video game. I read a lot of romance. So that, lately, I think Shadow and Bone actually would be, you know, it's a Netflix show now. Mm -hmm. 
I actually read Six of Crows, which is like the spinoff, I think, of Shadow and Bone. And the TV show is really cool because they're blending both series into the show. And I'm a huge fan of it. I think that would be an amazing video game. You've got the Darkling, you've got Grishaverse, excuse me, all these really cool characters. You've got like the old fantasy taverns and like the thieves and their scale. You know, some of the, one of the characters on Naj, you know, she's sort of like this kind of ninja she can like scale buildings and things and it, it reminded me a lot of thief the thief video game i think that would yeah it'd be brilliant i'd play it for sure D D style or more along the lines of open world like a sky i have to do open worlds I, I hate like linear sort of you're like stuck and you can't get forward unless you do this a million times yeah. until you finally master it and then i'm over it at a point no I, yeah i love open worlds because basically what i do is i play all the side quests first then i hit the main quest and once I've hit the main quest, if it's one of those games that'll let you continue on after the quest is done, like Fallout, mm -hmm. um, then I go and I just loot everything and I kill everyone and I just amass wealth <laughs> and just to, like level up as much as I can and just basically destroy the villagers' lives. That's <laughs> kind of how I do it. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like the first thing I did was I maxed out my sneak skill, stealth skill in Skyrim, and I just literally shot people in the knees with arrows. Yeah, it was just great. Exactly. Yeah, I was the archer. I had the arrows and I loved the sneak um, aspect. And when the DLCs came out and I had every single house, you know, that you get, and I had like the bored husband that was like off to another adventure, my love, you know, and you're like, yeah, just sit there and drink your beer while I go kill dragons. Great. <laughs> I brought all these wheels of cheese from that entire place I raided and you're just having a beer. Exactly. <laughs> Just keep the children alive, please. Yeah. <laughs> what was the first book that made you cry? The Lover by Marguerite Doris. It was a book that I probably shouldn't have read at the age that I read. It was actually called The North China Lover and the movie was called The Lover. You know, it was pretty sexually explicit, but I didn't really see that at that age. I was more like into this whole love story between this younger French girl and this older Chinese man and just they were from different classes. He was rich. She was poor. They just had this like heart wrenching love story. And she had a horrible family that was just awful to her. And he had to eventually, you know, be arranged into a marriage that was like suited for his you know, class and everything. And yeah, I was, I was like 15 or 16. And I was just sobbing at the end of it. Um, and then I watched the movie and I sobbed even more. I don't think a lot of people are aware of that book anymore. It was pretty popular. It's in its time. And, and there's always been this sort of question if it was biographical of Marguerite Doris, uh, something that happened in her life possibly, so, which made me like cry even more. Cause I was like, Oh my God, this really happened to her. But yeah. That, that book definitely. And then Wuthering Heights, um, that was probably like the first, my first foray into like actual, like what I consider a dark romance, um, between, you know, Catherine and Heathcliff. Obviously reading as much as you do, you must've come across some authors that maybe originally you didn't enjoy, but later on in life you came to enjoy. Do you know who those were? Yeah. I think, you know, when I was, like I said, when I was young, I was a very angsty teenage girl, like most, most of us teenage girls were. And so I read a lot of like VC Andrews, Twilight type of twi Twilight was way after my teenage years, but that kind of stuff. And I was not really into male writers, I guess, when I was younger, I just didn't, didn't relate. Um, and then as I've gotten older, I've read a lot more sort of like satire and, and nonfiction. I became a huge, huge fan of Kurt Vonnegut and Hunter S. Thompson. And those books I definitely would not have enjoyed when I was, you know, younger. So that kind of surprised me. And, and when I got more into like philosophy and things like that, and now I'm like, you know, reading Plato's Republic and <laughs> stuff that I never would have picked up, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, we're doing pretty good. This is a good pace. I like it. Yeah. It's, it's great to have a, a talented person such as yourself, you know, and that understands the whole podcasting side of things as well, too. Yeah. Speaking of podcasting, though, how did you get involved with with spoiler country. I was supposed to be at Emerald City Comic Con in 2020. <laughs> so it was my first year that I would have been there as a pro. I got the pro pass and I was so excited because I didn't have a table or anything like that, but I was just excited to go as a professional and be able to network. And I was going to bring some of my books with me and, you know, hope to make some contacts. And anyhow, 2020 happened. The con got canceled. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, that didn't work out. 
about a week or two later, after they announced the cancellation, I got an email from Spoiler Country asking if I'd be interested in coming on the show for just a quick 15 minute you know, segment along with other creators that they'd invited to um, just talk about my my wares, as they put it, you know, since I missed that opportunity to do it um, at Comic-Con. So I agreed and uh, it was so much fun. I hit it off with the two of, two of them, Kenrick and John, really well. And they, so much so that they said, well, we have to have you back on for a full segment, you know, full hour so we can really talk about your stuff. And so we did that about a few months later. And again, just had a blast, really connected, laughed a lot. If you go back and listen to that episode, we are literally just hysterically laughing the whole time. Yeah, we just kept in touch on Twitter. And then, yeah, Kenrick asked me, I think in the summer of 2020, if I'd be interested in joining the podcast and being an interviewer. And I said, yes. And uh, it was, yeah, it was very nerve wracking. As I was telling you earlier, my first like they threw me into the, the fire. They were like, all right, well, your first interview is going to be Dacre Stoker. You know, it's Bramker's great, great nephew. And I'm such a huge, you know, Dracula fan. And I was just kind of freaking out a little bit. He was just couldn't be nicer. Such a nice guy. We're still friends to this day. Like he, he friended me on Facebook and um, I was just like blown away <laughs> at how cool he was. Yeah. And so I just started doing interviews. Um, it got to the point where I was doing four or five a week and I've just talked to some really awesome people in the comic book industry, the entertainment industry. I've interviewed Taboo from the Black Eyed Peas twice. You know, just things you just like, like pinching yourself. Like, what is this my life now? This is so awesome. So now I'm, you know, helping out with other things on the podcast, doing, learning some editing, doing some bookings, trying to get guests, things like that. So I'm having fun. You always remember your first podcast, no matter <laughs> how bad or how good it was. Right. <laughs> it's, it's always ingrained in your mind, no matter what. Yeah. And you know, it's funny is when I first started, I didn't have a mic. I didn't have headphones or anything. I was just, my phone. I and, and my computer was crap. If you listen to the audio of it, it I sound horrible because I just sound like I'm underwater, you know, with this iPhone, <laughs> no, no proper setup. So after a few of those, kind of like, we need to get you a mic. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> but when you get when you get hooked, you get hooked, and it's a blast. And you know, yeah. I, I hope you have many years uh, continuing to do this. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, as, as a host and uh, as a guest on other podcasts as well. Yeah, I love it. Like you said, I'm I'm hooked. I'm addicted to it. I love I love being on both sides. I love being interviewed. I love interviewing. It's really fun when you can have conversations with with people that you may not, you know, necessarily meet in real, you know, regular life. And all of a sudden you're spending an hour or two with them. It's nice, especially during the last few years that we've, you know, been isolated and stuff. So I think it's been great for not only us to do it, but for people to listen, you know, it makes them feel closer to their favorite, you know, comic book artist or favorite actor. Obviously we can't switch to the last couple of questions I have just yet because we have questions from the internet and <laughs> well ironically and specifically it just happened to be some of your fellow <laughs> co-hosts and uh wonderful people of course that's the country it just happened to be like that um, they're heckling me yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are <laughs> two or three questions here specifically from them looks like four actually okay and technically a fifth but you know jay you bastard uh, we're not gonna ask that <laughs> no no he's it was, a, it was a funny one don't get me wrong but you know do you, am i i'm gonna ask you who your favorite child is next time you come <laughs> right out. yes please ask him that <laughs> first question of course is of course from from casey that's good. what is the best advice for writers just starting out i would say the best advice is to learn your craft learn your genre um, have a clear goal of what you want to do and to learn about the different avenues to get there because there are multiple different ways to become published. There's indie publishing, which is when you self-publish yourself and put it up on Amazon. Small press, which is you know, different than big pub. You don't need an agent to get into a small press. You just have to research the good ones and submit your manuscript. And then there is the big traditional publishing um, avenue, which is where you would try to find an agent who would sell your books to those big publishers. So you definitely want to find out like what is the right path for you, how much control you want to give up or not give up because all of those have different pros and cons. So do your research, but really know your craft, hone your craft, practice writing all the time as much as you can, at least in the beginning, until you understand like your own writing routines and what you're capable of, because it is 
such a learning process. So that's my best advice. I mean, when I first started out, I soaked up every article on writing I could find, every craft book, every writing course that I could afford. You know, some of them are expensive and not necessary. So there's a lots of free ones and affordable ones out there as well. Following other authors on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and, you know, listening to their trials and tribulations and just following their careers and seeing what they're doing is really important, um, specifically in the genre that you want to be in and make a splash. And so that's like my biggest advice. I mean, there's so much advice. There's a ton that you could, you know, it depends on what stage you're at. If you're at the very, very beginning and you're like, I have this idea, I want to write a book, just start writing it though. Don't worry about the mechanics of it. I would just write bits of dialogue that came to me and I'd have this, it all organized in my computer and, you know, in a folder and I would write like scenery and I would write backstory that like never even made it into the novel, but it was just important for me to like get these ideas and thoughts down before I lost them or forgot them or whatever. You can always edit a first draft. You can't edit a blank page. Kind of ties in then with Kenrick asking his questions as well. You know, do you outline your stories before writing? So Sounds like you do, but I could be wrong. I do. Yeah, I do outline and I'm pretty diligent about it. I write extensive outlines, which basically means I literally break down like each scene one by one. There's lots of different templates, like the hero's journey. There's, you know, so many different like names they call the different templates. I just do my own thing. I have a notebook and I'll write scene one. (laughs) This is what's going to happen. Scene two. I spent about two weeks doing that, really fleshing it out. And it's not set in stone. I can always change things as I go. And as the story unfolds, it really helps me to hit my deadlines and to not get lost. There have been instances where after I've written a few books, I'm like, oh, I can just write a book. I don't need an outline. Um, No, (laughs) I do. (laughs) You get lost really quickly. And there are people, don't get me wrong, there are people that are proud pantsers and that's how they write books and that's what they like. And my hat's off to them that they are able to finish a book that way because I just cannot. I have to have an outline. I learned the the hard way mid through that I needed to stick to what I did in the beginning, which is have those outlines and um, have that research and, you know, all that world building. Continue on with his questions, because honestly, they are good questions. They are. They're really good. Touch upon, I was going to touch upon these, sort of. I have other versions of this, but yeah. like I said, very good question. Next question of his is, what is the hardest part of writing, the beginning, middle, or the end? The beginning, definitely. Because for me, especially, like, I have a hard time not self-editing as I go. And this is like, do as I say, not as I do. You just write your first draft, even if it's messy, but, and which I did in the beginning. And now, you know, I've written and published nine novels and it's harder for me to stick to that because of all the techniques and tools I've learned. It's really hard for me to not be super aware of like, oh, this isn't, you shouldn't write it like this. This is passive or this is whatever. So it's hard for me to write first drafts now because of all this stuff in my head that I've gained from editors and (laughs) publishers and things. So yeah, that would probably be like the hardest thing is the beginning because I just want the beginning to be perfect. I mean, when I wrote Blooded Magic, I rewrote that first chapter probably 25 times. It's the hook. It's what's going to help someone turn the page essentially. So I'm very particular. And sometimes too, when you're writing the beginning, you're, you're still learning who your characters are. You're not quite in their heads yet. So once I get to, I don't say chapter six, chapter seven, that's when I'm in the zone and I'm like, all right, I know what's happening. I know what's going on and I can kind of get through it. There is a little bit of a sagging middle sometimes if you don't have enough conflict, if you don't have enough subplot, the story can drag and you're like, oh, what am I, what's going to happen next? But I always know the beginning and the ending or like at least how it's going to start and how it's going to end usually before I even start writing, especially the ending. I always know instinctually, but the beginning is hard, not because I don't know where it starts, but just sort of how I want it to flow and open up. You don't want too much backstory. You don't want to withhold too much either. It's just this fine balance of setting up the characters and the scenes. So I do struggle with that. Once you get through that draft and I have to like slap myself, I'm like, okay, just do it. Just write whatever. Just write. It doesn't matter what you write. You're going to go back and fix it. Once I do that, then yeah, the first chapter gets rewritten like a bunch of times. Beginning is hardest for me. How does the setting affect your narrative though? (laughs) Well, the setting to me can be its own character. I'm really into ambiance and mood and tone is really important to me. Music. I'm a visual person. I have Pinterest boards for my books. Um, Some of them are public, some of them are private when the book is still in development. Just random things like a candelabra, a gargoyle, an archway, 
the forest, you know, things like that that just invoke story ideas and put me in the mood of the novel. Definitely setting is to me a, a character in itself. Um, it can really you know, influence the scene, you can use, I mean, if you're writing a battle scene, you know, you can use parts of the setting to assist in the battle. If you're slamming someone's, you know, head into a stone statue or digging gravel into their eyes, you know, or if it's in the ocean and you're using, you know, the momentum of the water to, to win your fight. I mean, there's so many different aspects, but for me, it's a lot of just like mood and tone really said that for me. Last question. That was my own, but last question from Kenrick <laughs> is, what is the timeline for your first audiobook? So I'm not sure yet. I just signed a contract for Immortal Billionaires, the first book after I fall. So in the beginning stages, I don't really have a whole lot of information at this point. So I'm not even disclosing who I signed with at this point either, because they haven't announced it either. So I'm super excited. It's been on my bucket list forever to have an audiobook. I'm just really thrilled that it's happening. And we'll see. And I'll keep everybody updated. Like as soon as I know anything, I promise. <laughs> Congratulations on that. That's, Thank that's you. a great accomplishment. Thank you. How does that rank in terms of when you first got published to signing this contract? Where does that rank in your career? There's no feeling better than selling your first book, just knowing someone is going to publish your words. So that is definitely forever going to be one of my most prized, I guess, moments of my life. They sent me the email on Christmas night in 2017. <laughs> yes. I was like sitting around fire at my house. We had just had Christmas dinner at my boyfriend's parents' house and my mom and my sister were here. We're just chatting, you know, we're drinking wine and stuff. I get this like email notification and it's from City L Press, just basically offering me a contract for not just the book I gave them, but, oh, we want you to write a trilogy and we're going to buy all three books. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And everyone's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Who died? And I'm like, no, just hold on a second. And I, I opened the email and I read it to them and like my mom's crying and kind of like in shock. Like they just, not that they didn't believe it would happen. It just kind of happened really quickly. So that was pretty up there with memorable moments that you'll, you know, never forget in your life. But the audiobook thing was cool because like for people that are authors, they know it's, it's really difficult because you either need to sell your rights or you have to pu produce it yourself, which is like thousands of dollars that not all of us have. So it's a really challenging thing to get. So I had just listened to a podcast, ironically, and heard this audio publisher talking about their company and just what they offer to authors. And I thought, well, you know what, I'm just going to submit it and see what happens. And my books have won some awards and my rankings are pretty good. So I thought maybe I have a chance. And sure enough, they offered me a little deal. And so I thought, oh, this is exciting. And for me, you know, this is January, 2022. I was like, what a great way to start the year considering last year have been crap. It was exciting. It was just, it was one of those things on my bucket list um, as an author that I wanted to achieve. I'm excited to see what happens and what the experience is like and what I'll learn from it, good or bad. You know what I mean? It's I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything I haven't touched upon that you'd like to showcase with those that are watching and listening to this interview? Yeah. I mean, I just finished book four in my Mortal Billionaires series. So it's a little bit of a different series compared to my other two. Like if people have read the other two, those are very urban fantasy, quest-driven, revenge-driven. Everything I write is dark. That part is the same. But Immortal Billionaires is my first foray into a steamy, very steamy <laughs> paranormal romance and dark romance. I've been reading a lot of amazing dark romance books. And so towards the end of 2020, when I had just finished up one of my books for CDL Press, I had some time on my hands and I decided to try something totally new. So the first book, it's called After I Fall. And it is a story about a human woman who has kind of a tragic past, moves from a small town to New York City to pursue her dreams as a chef, ends up getting a job at an Italian restaurant, which is owned by a very handsome Italian vampire. They have a very toxic sort of obsessive relationship. And then there's this underlying plot arc that goes throughout the whole series. Each book is a different couple. Each book is a standalone to where that romantic relationship gets a happy ending at each book, but the subplot continues throughout and then sort of ties up in book four. And now I'm working on uh, the fifth book in that series, new couple and a, um, somewhat of a new 
subplot. So that'll be, um, hopefully that'll be out by the end of February or early March, depending on um, how I get my edits done. But yeah, it's a really fun series, it's something completely different. And it's opened up my mind to, you know, some different genres and things like that. I am going to be writing a dark academia series with heavy dark romance themes, more of the super explicit <laughs> type of stuff. I always have to reach into my whole like mythology bag as well, like and based on historical things. So I do have one, I'm not going to give too much away, but it is loosely based on something that has to do with Marie Antoinette. I'm really like fascinated by her. Um, I always have been. And just recently I did a 23 and anything. thing. My dad did as well. And so we were like studying all of our, you know, genealogy lines. And apparently we, my grandmother is, belongs to the same haploid group as Marie Antoinette. So we're like, oh my God, um, <laughs> it was kind of cool. Yeah, I'm definitely going into that area. Um, this is going to be totally off the wall and I haven't really told anyone this just because it's like, I don't know when this will happen, but at some point in my life, I would like to write a paranormal Western. I am obsessed with the Wild West and I loved Westworld. I'm loving that new Yellowstone spinoff show, 1880 three or 1886. Like I'm getting, I always get the year wrong. I love anything that has to do. I, my favorite back to the future movie was the one where they go to the wild west. Like, Number two. yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. Ironically, that was filmed in a little town that's outside where my mom lives. <laughs> At what point are we good enough? Mm -hmm. Wow. That is such a good question. When we stop criticizing ourselves really, because like no one can tell you that you're good enough. I don't believe in basing my life or my emotions on others. That's something that I have been really diligent about in the past 10 years, you know, just as you get older and you become, you know, more comfortable in your own skin as a woman, especially you just stop caring about what others think of you or what others expect of you. I think you become enough when you learn to love and respect yourself and not give a shit about what anyone else thinks really. What is the wisest piece of advice someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you through your career? Gosh, there's been, there's been a lot of great advice. You got to just write, you can't edit a blank page. You can, you can edit crap, but you can't edit a blank page. So that's been a huge thing. And actually, you know, there's a lot of advice out there that says you have to write every day if, if, to be considered a real writer. And I don't believe that, um, despite so many famous people, so famous writers that have said it. And that, if that works for them, great. But you know, you don't have to write every day. Um, you have to make the most of the days you do write. That's really important. The best advice I've ever gotten though was in a fortune cookie. <laughs> and it was just live in this moment. And that's what I do. I don't dwell on the past. I try not to and agonize over the future too much. I'm very much into living in the moment that I'm in. And that doesn't mean not planning or not having goals or things like that. Just not letting, you know, today become yesterday or, you know what I mean? It's just, it's very important. You know, life is short and this is, this is what we got. This moment's what we got. So just got to make the most of it. What is something that everyone should experience once in their lifetime? Oh my goodness. Playing a video game. <laughs> well, um, that's a given. <laughs> yeah. Well, falling in love, I guess, which I think people, people do. Eating really good food. I, I'm a big foodie. You know, I love to cook, you know, once in your life, just going to like one nice, like really fancy restaurant, like one that you would just like never go to, you know, like saving up and, you know, for a special occasion and just going and, you know, enjoying six courses and just living it up in that sense. That's, that's really fun. God, there's so many things, you know, I'm not much of a, a thrill seeker. I don't, I'm not very naturey <laughs> or outdoorsy at all. Uh, I like wine tasting and like going to Tahoe for the casinos, you know what I mean? So I think just once in your life, you should just do something completely gluttonous, like without guilt or judgment, you know, like if you want to eat an entire wheel of cheese, then do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like don't make it an everyday habit, but, um, I just, I don't know. I think just doing what you want to do. I mean, we're adults at this point. That's one of the things I learned, like from, you know, like when I was younger, you know, you're always worrying about like calories and you're worrying about this, you're worrying about that. And, you know, when I turned, I don't know, like 40, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to the best restaurant in the town that I live in. And I'm just going to drink whiskeys and just eat steak and 
to have a good old time. Like, I think it's important. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, I would say artistically, I have two, I have two answers. So artistically, Anne Rice, she was, you know, Interview of the Vampire was the first paranormal book I read and fell in love with New Orleans and vampires and that whole genre. Hale devoured her books, you know, as many as I could find. And she was just such an inspiration to me as a writer and for me to get into that genre and to become so fascinated and basically just shaped my entire psyche essentially around that. Aside from like creatively, just in real life, my mom, I love my mom. She's um, one of the strongest women that I know. She's, you know, my best friend and, you know, her and me and my sister, we're such a tight knit little unit. We just have the best time together. And she's always just been the most supportive and encouraging and of anybody ever in my life. So she's definitely uh, my inspiration. From a professional perspective, you have created nine novels. You are working towards an audio book. You have done much in your career from a professional perspective, and you've become successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do. Yeah, I do. I'm very goal oriented and I set goals. I have lists in my phone for everything, not just grocery lists. Like literally I have a list for everything. And uh, every year I set like, you know, 2021 goals, 2022 goals. Some I still haven't hit. And oftentimes I do end up hitting some of the goals that I'm, you know, striving for. Yeah, I definitely personally think that I, I consider myself successful. Do I want more? Obviously, of course, I think we all do. I think we all have to keep growing and wanting things and keep striving for things and new goals. But yeah, I definitely feel like I've accomplished a lot, not just with my writing, but I didn't go to college. Um, I've like actually go to like, you know, this, the way that people go to college, you know, I guess the traditional way um, I have been taking community classes for the past 10 years. And I am like halfway to getting my associate's degree because I take the classes when I have time to, when I can, you know, fit it in. I have a 4.0 in that community college and made the Dean's list last year. And so that's like something really important to me. So every time I, you know, accomplish you know, those three units or whatever, and I get that A, I'm super excited. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I don't believe in failure. I believe in learning from mistakes. I believe in, I mean, not that I don't believe in failure. Like, obviously, I just, the word failure sounds just so like, oh, like you failed. I think things happen for a reason. I think that you're always exactly where you're supposed to be. I have done things in my career out of, you know, trial and error to see like what it will do. And there are things that I'm like, okay, that doesn't work. That, that cost me a lot of money and it didn't produce any results. So I won't be doing that again. I don't really consider anything a failure if you've learned from it. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it is as an author or as a creative writer or as a creative person in general with whatever they choose to do. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oh, that's not such a good question. Just be authentic, really, and be true to yourself. You know, as I look at trying to inspire people myself, I'm actually going to be um, teaching a writing course in a few months to a group of teenagers um, that are affiliated with like a local library. And I got asked to do it. And I was really excited because talking to young people, young aspiring writers, when that passion is so new and raw, it's just important to me to be able to provide a positive perspective of things and to give them hope. I think it's really important not to, you know, to give up no matter what. I think it's those younger people grow up and start writing, the only way you can really inspire people is to be kind and to be true to yourself and be authentic. There will be those that follow you and, and want to read your work and, you know, that are moved by your work and are inspired. Even if it's just one person, you know, that's really all that matters. If you can touch like one person's life and make a difference, then, you know, that's enough for me.
Well, Melissa, I do hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming in the show. I really greatly really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, your questions are amazing. Really got me thinking. Um, I love the introspective part. It's it's awesome. I love it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, before I let you go, though, where can we find you and how can we support you? Not only on social media, but through your website or, or if you have a store as well. My website is melissasercha.com. And from there, I have links to social media sites and to direct links to Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And you can, you know, find all my books there. If you are on Kindle Unlimited, most of my books are on Kindle Unlimited. Yeah, I'm on pretty much every social media site <laughs> that exists, except Snapchat. I haven't figured that out yet. TikTok, I just started um, about a year ago and I'm having a lot of fun with TikTok. So I'm there, uh, Melissa Searcher Writes. Instagram is Melissa Searcher Writes. Twitter, I'm at Fluid Ghost. And on Facebook, um, you can just type in Melissa Sergio and you'll, you'll find my Facebook page. And then if you're a fan of the Immortal Billionaires series, I have an Immortal Billionaires group on there where I post a lot of, a lot of fun stuff and background information and character, like casting, like if my books were a movie, who would I cast? Things like that. So it's a fun group. And then I always tell people, you know, feel free to email me. My email is melissasergerwrites at gmail.com. If you're a writer, an author, aspiring author, that has any questions and needs any advice, my um, channels are open and I love to help. So, yeah. well, like I said, unfortunately, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Thanks, Melissa, again for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is unfortunately a little more updated than the website. <laughs> Uh, the pandemic hasn't been kind to me when it comes to updating my main website, but the YouTube is still working. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Our YouTube channel is of course at www.youtube.com forward slash TGT media. And of course, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on two geeks talk. Thank you.